I told you not to follow your dreams. Because that's only because mine, they, they never came true. But you're not me. You're not like me. gift real gift I want to take care of your part I got something for you part yeah I want I never made much money but I have my life insurance and I I tried to save everything I could and I want you to have that so you can pay attention to your, your singing. And you'll get a check every month so you can go chase your dream. And I want you to catch it. <laughs> Don't you ever look back. You promise. Well, good morning. So glad that you're with us. If you haven't been able to tell yet, we're in a series, Living the Dream. And today we're in week four, which is entitled Other People's Dreams. So if you have your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 39. It's where we're gonna be today. Welcome to those joining us online. We're glad you guys are here. Our Neely campus as well. I am so glad to be with you guys because I've been in Africa for a couple weeks in Nigeria and South Africa. And um, man, God's doing some great, great things. I don't have a lot of time to share. I'll, I'll do that this week in social media. Uh, we'll release that. So keep an eye on Mid City Social Media. We'll give you a full up, fuller update. But uh, we are a part of a family of churches called Every Nation. And our desire is to plant churches in every nation uh, on every campus in our generation. That's what we'd love to do. And we're on 80 nations throughout the globe. Isn't that cool? God's, God's really uh, given us opportunity. But what was interesting is there in, in Africa, I got to meet um, uh, a couple pastors who actually are pioneering two of our newest churches uh, in Burundi, which is the uh, poorest nation in Africa, and in Togo, a French-speaking nation in Africa, both of those are two newest nations we've planted churches in, which makes it 82 nations we've planted. So let's give God a hand for that, what he's doing. It's pretty cool. Uh, and you're a part of that. Through your giving, through your support, through all that you do, we get to do that together. Plant churches, reach campuses. Uh, it was great to be there. But one of the things I wanna point out before we dive into our text today is I, was, I had a lot of time in airports. And so there in the airport, I was uh, hanging out in one of those gift shop things at the airport, you know, where they sell random stuff. And uh, I was looking at all the random stuff that they sell. And I came across this like, this, you know, pile of, of glasses. And, uh, you know, I've always prided myself in God giving, caring about me and loving me more than my family because I've got good vision. And you guys know what I'm talking about. I mean, obviously God would care more about me to give me perfect vision. And I've lorded that over my family for years now, right? And then all of a sudden, I'm, I'm, I have time, so I, I take these reading glasses and I, I put them on and I'm like, wow, I'm able to see <laughs> what I was reading. So I'm, I'm gonna put these on in a minute. I just wanna point that out to the obvious that uh, humil uh, pride comes before the fall, all right? And so I'm gonna enjoy this. Genesis chapter 39 is where we are. Joseph um, has been put in prison. He's been falsely accused. Uh, he doesn't deserve to be there, but he is there. What happens there in prison? Let's find out. Uh, Genesis 39, we're gonna read quite a bit of scripture today. Verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Sometime after this, 
The cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them and he attended them. They continued for some time in custody. And one night, they both dreamed, the, both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, each his own dream and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in the master's house, why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, we have had dreams and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God. Please tell me the dream. Verse nine. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, in my dream, there was a vine before me and on the vine, there were three branches. And as soon as it budded, its blossoms shot forth and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, placed the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hands as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness of men and mention me to Pharaoh. And so get me out of this house, for I was indeed stolen out of the land of Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake-based baskets on my head, and in the uppermost basket, there were all sorts of, of baked food for Pharaoh but the birds were eating it out of the basket of my head. And Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation. The three baskets are three, three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree and the birds will eat the flesh from you. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. And after two whole years, Father, would you help us today understand your word? For your word is life. And God, I thank you that by your word we're sustained. And Lord, we look to you and your word today not the words of man, not the clever stories or words of any person, but your word that has the ability to change lives and destinies and families. Father, we trust you and welcome you to teach us and lead us. In the name of Jesus, everybody said, amen. One thing that we see here in this story, and I think it's important when we read the Bible, is to ask the question, God, what are you doing? Too often we read the Bible and it, we're asking the wrong question. We ask the question, what do you want to say to me? What am I going through? These are the kind of questions we go to the Bible with. But the best question to originally go to the Bible with is, God, what are you saying? What are you doing? And when we look at that, uh, we discover some things about God. And in this story, um, we, we find ourselves in the prison. We've been in the pasture. We've been in the pit. We've been at Potiphar's house and now we're in prison. And uh, we uh, find ourselves there. And here in this story, we find some things out about who God is and what he does. So there's four things about God I wanna recognize through the story of Joseph. The first thing is this, is that God is present in difficulty. Look at your neighbor and say, God is present in difficulty. Yes, he is. He is present. Verse 21 of chapter 39 says, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. This term, the Lord was with Joseph, occurs over four times in this passage. Over four different times, it says the Lord was with Joseph. 
The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. And often we believe something. We believe that if we are in a pit, we believe that if we're in a prison, we believe that if we're in in difficulty, that God isn't really there with us. It kind of goes like this. Um, We must have done something wrong. Something went awry. God's not around. So, So good circumstances equal God's blessing, but bad circumstances equal his curses. That's kind of how it goes. This is the the general kind of uh, theology that many people, even within the church, ascribe to. Things are going good, then then it's blessing. Things are going bad, it's cursing. But I got to tell you, I've been in pastoral ministry for over 20 years now. And it, it amazes me when I think about all the people I've come across that have gone through difficulty. Uh, they've gone through hardship or, or difficult times. They've gone through grieving, some of it unspeakable. They've gotten a diagnosis of cancer. Uh, their loved one passed before it seemed like they should have. Uh, uh, they've gone through accusations and hard times. And I've, I've had the kind of a front row seat, if you will, on seeing people respond to tragedy. And you know what's amazing to me? As many people that are followers of Jesus that are pursuing him, when tragedy and circumstances strike, so often I hear this similar refrain, and it goes like this. Yeah, it's really tough, but God has been near, right? Yeah, it's been hard, but man, it feels like God's been closer than he ever was. Uh, even talking with some people who go, man, I, I just... I feel like God's revealed himself in different and new ways through these hardships and through these circumstances. And, and as you hear them respond, and, and it comes in, out in various ways, like, like, like forgiveness, when all that seems that should be there is rage and resentment. Instead, it's forgiveness about, for someone who's done something wrong to them. And I don't know, I just have a peace. And I'm, I, I, I think about how they're doing and what they're thinking about. And all of these are examples that we see of, of people. Maybe you know you've been with them and, 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 and know that, that, man, it's in difficult circumstances at times that God draws near. Now, there's a difference sometimes, and let, let's acknowledge this. There's hard circumstances that we create ourselves. How many can admit that and are honest in church today? Yeah, you're like, you know what, I, I don't, I don't, I just am so stressed out by this debt. I don't know why. I mean, I know I got seven trucks, all $1,500 a month a piece. I bought that house I can't afford and I'm paying for, you know, vacations on the credit card, but I don't know why I'm so stressed. I mean, you probably created that. Like we can blame other people, but you just made some dumb decisions. Like, I don't want to call you dumb in church. I'm just saying like, that was just not smart, okay? It was not smart. And you're reaping some. So the, some of our hard circumstances because of decisions you made. But how many of you know there's also lots of hard circumstances we all walk through? You didn't make those decisions. Somebody else made those decisions. Some, something else happened. And you go, what, what is happening here? And it's in those difficulties, it's in that hardship that God not only makes his self present, but it says multiple times in this passage, or, or here in this specific text that we read today is that God showed Joseph when he was in prison his steadfast love. There was a, there was a practical showing a revealing of God's love for Joseph in the middle of difficult circumstances. See, God is with you in difficulty too. Um, look, if you will, for his steadfast love because Lots of times what we really want, what we want from God is, God, if you really love me, you'll remove me from the circumstances. How many know I would like that, right? God, if you really cared, if you really love me, why don't you remove me from the circumstances? But notice, God doesn't do that. Instead, God comes and joins you in your circumstances. And when you think about the character and nature of God, this has been his way all the, all the, all the way. Uh, in Genesis 3, when Humanity falls in rebellion to God and they choose they're gonna decide what is good and what is evil in this moment. God doesn't just take all the good from the earth and create a new earth and put 
the good in the new good earth. He doesn't just recreate. You know what he does? He redeems that which he created. See, God is not just into recreation. He is into redeeming what exists. And so God didn't just create something that was perfect and different and abandon what was broken and what was wrong. No, no, no. Instead, he came through his son Jesus and entered into our broken world, didn't he? He came into our pit, came into our prison, came into our mess. And you know what you need to know if you're going through difficulty today? He'll come into your grief. He'll come right into the middle of your marriage. He'll come right into the middle of your family because that's what the gospel's all about. God coming to us because we can't get to him. He doesn't just start over. Instead, he comes in difficulty and is near to us in our circumstance. It's how he works. It's what he does. And we see that play out in the life of Joseph. God is present in difficulty. Here's a question for us to think about um, um, uh, and a recognition. I'm sure Joseph felt like this being put in prison was really a setback, but really it was a setup. I'm sure he felt so far and distant from the promises of God that he, God had made him. He felt so distant from them now that he was in prison. But you know what? He was actually closer than he had ever been to what God's promises were. We know that because we get to read the whole story going, dude, you're almost there. You've, you've passed all these tests. This is actually an easy one. You're, you're gonna go right past this and you're gonna be in the position that God wants you to, that you saw when you were 17 years old. We see that as we read the story, but Joseph didn't feel that in the story when he's living it. That prison felt like it was the farthest thing from God's dream, but actually he was closer than he had ever been. See, where is God's presence in your circumstances and how has he revealed his steadfast love to you? It's a great question to talk about. Maybe over lunch today, uh, maybe with your family or friends, like, hey, when you've gone through hardship, where was God in that hardship? Where did you sense his love? And how did he reveal himself to you and show his steadfast love? Maybe it was through a friend. Maybe it was through a, a word of encouragement. Maybe it was a promise you were holding on to that meant God showed himself. But encourage yourself and talk with others about this because God is present in difficulty. Amen. Secondly, we see not only is God present in difficulty, God is preparing Joseph. He's preparing him. Look at verse 22 of Genesis 39. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. We see a pattern in Joseph's life and we've seen it from the very beginning. And here's what this pattern looks like. First, in the pasture, Joseph is a shepherd under his father, right? He's a shepherd under his father. He's, he's uh, um, his, da his dad owns the whole thing. He's the son and he's out there herding sheep. And his father is the one giving him instructions. Go check on your brothers, do this. And he's second in command. Then we see uh, in the, in the, uh, in the Potiphar's house, he's an overseer under Potiphar. So Potiphar is the, uh, this captain of the guard um, and Joseph is number two in command. Uh, and he takes, takes charge of everything in Potiphar's house. He pays the bills, he mows the lawn, he runs the, he runs the staff, he makes sure everything is taken care of. He, may, he gets the groceries. He, he cleans everything. He makes sure everything's clean. He does everything. He's over it all. It oversees it all. Second only to Potiphar. Thirdly, we see here in the prison. Once again, we find him that he is second only to the leader of the prison, the prison keeper. He's the number two guy. And in, in anything in the prison, the prison keeper didn't even care about. He had keys. To, he was a prisoner in the prison and he had keys. Could have let himself out at any moment but the prison keeper trusted him and entrusted him with all of this. And what we'll see here next week as we continue on in the story, eventually he's gonna be second only to Pharaoh. So we have this pattern where wherever Joseph goes, he elevates to the top spot underneath someone else. He's always the number two guy. He's always uh, ra raised up, risen up into leadership in whatever role that he's in. It's interesting. What is happening here? 
Here's what's happening. Joseph is in school. He's in school. He is being prepared. He's being trained. He's in the middle of training, learning what authority is, learning how to manage people, learning about leadership, learning about uh, all the things you need to manage and lead something when the stakes are low. God is preparing him for something bigger. I think back to my first jobs. Um, I was, uh, I got, I started working early on. When I was a teenager, I worked in a coffee shop, learned a lot about responsibility, showing up on time, serving the customer, all of that from a very early age. I worked at Foot Locker for a season. That was a lot of fun as a student, you know, basically blowing all your money on shoes and stuff, right, that you don't really need. Uh, that was a great job. I love that job. And then I became a file room clerk in a hospital. Let me tell you that, that is boring. If you do that, I'm sorry. We'll pray for you at the end. I did it and I just have a heart for you because you're stuck in a dungeon with files. Now, now all of it I'm sure is digital, but at the time, if you broke your wrist 70 years ago and you came back to the hospital 71 years later, I've got to go find that wrist x-ray that you got like it's in some far basement. So my job was fetching x-rays in these file rooms and these dark crevices of the hospital and filing them meticulously by name and by date and all of this stuff that I'm no good at. That's what I did for, for a while. And then I got a job uh, at a... At a um, at a bank and I did mortgage lending. So I lent out money. Uh, matter of fact, my very first loan uh, was to this family that a few years ago, I was walking through the church and I saw them. They started attending this church. I was like, you gave me a shot. Thank you so much. And I'm glad I didn't mess it up. Um, it, was well, it was amazing to me. Maybe not to you, but it was amazing to me. And uh, I, I did these mortgage loans. And it was so interesting. Mortgage lending is interesting because you have this file that takes a while to process and you need all this information from people to get them a home loan. Like you need 60 documents, right? And they give you three of them and say, I'll get the rest of it to you later, right? So your whole job is to basically bug the person to get you all the documents you need to get it underwritten so that you can approve of their loan. And so they come back and give you five documents the next day. And then they, they're busy because they're out of town. And then a week later, you, you, you track them down for eight more documents and you get that kind of done. So you end up with a file full of a, a, a desk, full of files, half to three quarters to one quarter finished, right? And you don't even know if one of them's ever gonna get done. You just, you feel like it's a process that will never, ever end. That's what it feels like. And man, I learned so much during that job. Oh my gosh, I, I, I just can't believe, I mean, uh, the things that, that I learned in that time. Then I got a job in ministry. And I remember my first job in ministry, I came across a, a people issue pretty early on, management. And I was, I was all of 22 years old. I was a youth pastor and I had an intern and she was like 20. So I was much older than her, <laughs> like by at least two years, right? But I'm, it was a different life stage. Kayla and I were married, we married early. So I, me and Kayla and I were married we're about to go on our first vacation, which is two nights in the big city of Rio Dosa, New Mexico, all right? And we're excited about it. We ever, everybody knows. My intern comes up last minute and she says, hey, all of my friends are gonna take this, we're going on this camping trip and I'm gonna be, but, but we'd be gone Sunday. Can I miss, on, miss Sunday? I said, well, we're, I've already planned this little weekend vacation. So no, I need you here to cover everything. So you knew that. And I know this is last minute. You can still go, but you just got to be back by Sunday. She's like, oh, okay. And so she pushed a little bit. I don't know. No, I mean, should I really go? I, are you sure I can't go? I'm like, no, I, yeah, I need you here. So that was fine. And I did it as best as a 22-year-old could. And then I remember I'm relaxing in the mountains of New Mexico and I get a call on a Saturday night from my intern. And she says, hey, I just wanted to check with you. I'm here at this camping trip and all of us are packed up, ready to come home, but I'm the only one that has to be back. And I just want to check one more time if maybe I could stay. And I'm looking at this phone like, I, 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 
I thought we already dealt with this, you know? And I'm 22. I don't know how to parent. I've never parented anybody. I didn't know. I just thought when you said something, people did that. You know what I mean? Like, they, like you just, when you said it, they just did. Like, so this pushback, I, I don't know how to deal with it. I hadn't managed a lot of people in my life. And so <laughs> I'm like mad, but I'm trying to hide that I'm mad. And I'm trying to find wisdom and I'm learning how to manage. And so she's like, but oh, I'll come home. I'll come home. But just everyone's really wanting to stay and they all know that I'm the only one. So we just wanted to call you and see if there's any chance. And I remember, I don't know if I handled this right, um, but I remember just saying, hey, um, you do whatever you would like to do and you'll face the consequences on Monday morning. <laughs> I don't know, that's the best I had. You know what I mean? That's what I had at 22. What was happening in the... In all of those instances, you know what was happening? I was being trained. In all of those moments, God was preparing me for something more, for something bigger, for something different. I was learning about discipleship. Discipleship isn't something, and becoming a disciple of Jesus isn't something you just check off. It's a process, a daily process that not just everyone else is going through, I'm going through as well. And it's like those files on my desk. It feels like it never ends because it doesn't. We're constantly following Jesus, learning and growing and engaging with him. There's always uh, to, uh, to lead the things that God's called me to lead. I had to figure out early on how to manage people. And sometimes I succeeded, sometimes I failed. And maybe you can relate to this too, because you've been in a preparatory time. The jobs that you've had and the experiences that you've had, God can use all of those things to develop you and prepare you for the future. It was school. And that's where Joseph finds himself. He's, he's learning how to, how in the world can he run a kingdom if he can't run some sheep in a pasture? How in the world is he supposed to manage an administration when he can't manage a household? How can he lead and use wisdom if he can't lead a prison in some hard circumstances with some difficult people? And he learns all of those things while, the, while, the, while the, the cost is low. Let me ask you a question. What is God preparing you for? I guarantee you, whatever you're going through is preparation for something else God has. What's he preparing you for? In your business, in your family, in the jobs that you're in. And let me encourage you, don't despise the preparation. Don't despise it, embrace it. Be faithful to whatever he puts in front of you without complaint. Whatever field he has you in, whatever he has you doing, be faithful without complaint. You know, well, you don't, you don't, Pastor Dan, you don't know my boss. He's hard and, and he's really tough. Let me just tell you, they all are. I get it. So he's like, well, I, I don't, am I, am I really, do I really, uh, I, I like to complain because it makes me feel better. Look at your neighbor and say, I hate complainers. Go ahead and tell them. Look at your other and say, God does too. So go ahead and just tell them, God doesn't, God's not a big fan of complainers. Have you noticed that? Just read your Bible. God's not really like, oh, you're complaining. Okay. I see it your way now. No, 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 no. God doesn't like complainers. Be faithful with what he's called you to do. And I know he's going, ah, but my boss is hard. My supervisor, man, let me just tell you, look at your neighbor. They got the same kind of supervisor you have. They're all, everybody's trying to figure it out. But let me just tell you, be faithful with what God's. Embrace the training time that God has you in. It's not just about that intern. It's not just about that, that file. It's not about that. God is preparing you for something more. He's preparing you for something bigger. What's he doing in you? And you have an opportunity to recognize it. All right, so let's look at the next thing God's doing. The third thing we see God doing here, God calls, Joseph, calls on Joseph to serve the dreams of others. This is my favorite. It's the story of the baker and the cupbearer. Joseph is basically babysitting these guys, right? They were sent from the palace. Uh, they're connected to Pharaoh uh, and he's in charge of the prison. So he's over them officially. And there was an opportunity here, Joseph had to respond in one of two ways. First, upon hearing their dreams and their, the fact that they were troubled, he could have been resentful. Everyone say resentful. 
could have been resentful. Like, oh, you got dreams? I had some dreams once, right? Years ago, I had a dream, and I'd made the mistake of sharing that dream. And that, you know where it got me? It got me into a pit, got me th uh, falsely accused, thrown into prison. This is where dreams will get you. Don't dream. Keep your dreams to yourself. Eat your food, sit in the prison cell. I mean, like, right, this is, this is the way Bart's dad in the, the film clip that we just looked at a little bit ago, and I can only imagine, he, his dreams hadn't come true, and for years he was resentful. So resentful, he didn't want anyone else's dreams to come true. Matter of fact, when other people had dreams, he would squash those dreams. He was a dream killer. But there was something in him that switched. There was something in him that changed, that said, hey, I just, I don't wanna be a dream killer. I don't wanna be one that, that just is walking and resentful. I wanna make, take whatever I have and whoever I am to make other dreams a reality. So you can be resentful or you can serve other people's dreams. This was the choice of Joseph. Was he going to engage the cupbearer and the um, baker in their dreams or was he going to be resentful? He had every right to be resentful. He could have totally done that. Looking at the, the arc of his story, he could have totally done that. But no, 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 instead he responds, God's the one who makes dreams a reality. He's the one who understands and interprets him. He understands in this moment, Joseph does, that he's a servant not just of God, but of these two people that are sitting in front of him. So he offers to serve. And ultimately, Joseph's dream would be fulfilled in part because of one of them. See, often we don't get the connection that serving other people's dreams in doing so, we actually are drawing closer to God's dream for our own lives. When we begin to serve other people's dreams, our, the dream God has for us becomes more of a reality, not less. See, this is hard because we think, well, if I take time to help them and serve them and do this, then what about me? And who's looking out for me? And I've got to go get mine. And I've got to advance my career and advance my place and all of these things. But actually, actually, the opposite is true. See, um, the business world has even found that this is true. In, in uh, Forbes magazine, 1998 or 19 or 2008, uh, 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 there's a, a Forbes article that is entitled this. Let me read it to you. By Amy Anderson. The fastest way to achieve success is to first help others succeed. Isn't that interesting? That the business community have actually discovered a biblical truth. That actually, if you want to, you want to accomplish things, then you've got to help others and serve others succeed. Uh, see, this is, I think, important for us to, to get our arms around because we live in a culture that's narcissistic. It's always about us. And if it's always about us, it's about our life and about our challenges and our things that we're going through and where we want to go and our dreams and where we want to get to, then we'll never really accomplish the dream that God has for us because he's put us in community one with another. He's set us in a, in a group of people. He set us in a family and families he set in churches and churches he set in communities and communities he set in nations and nations in the globe. Like we are a part of something bigger than ourselves. And there's something about not just loving God and, and, and pursuing him, there's something about loving people. Most of the New Testament is actually instructions on how we get along with other people. Because I know you're amazing, but all other people are sometimes hard to get along with. Come on, can I get an amen from somebody? Like, right, what do you do when someone makes you mad? What do you do when someone offends you? What do you do when someone uh, steals from you or takes from you or doesn't treat you with respect or what do you do when you do that to someone else? How do you restore, repair those things? And lots of the New Testament is about how to practically love one another. How do we actually love one another? And in doing so, serving one another. See, God has put people around you. And if you stopped for a moment just to think about, God, what is your dream for my spouse's life? Have you asked that question? 
God, what do you want to do with her? God, what is your dream for my kid's life? God, what, what, is, what is your dream for my parents' life as they age? God, what is your dream for my coworker's life? What do you want for him? What do you want for her? God, what is your dream for my neighbor's life? Is there something you want me to do, God, to help make their dream that you have for them a reality? And you know what happens is when you begin to get our eyes off of ourselves and we begin to serve other people, we actually are getting closer and closer to the dream that God has for us. We don't do it so we can. We don't do it for success. We do it because Jesus came not to be served, but to what? Serve. What if you are in your family? What if you're in your group of friends? What if you're in your neighborhood? What if you're in your workplace? Not just to get ahead and accomplish your dreams, but what if you're there to help accomplish the dreams of others? This is where Joseph finds himself. He could be resentful, but no, instead he serves other people's dreams. I think this is a, a beautiful part of the story. Are these people tools for us to accomplish our own dreams or are we servants of God looking to love and serve? Finally, the fourth thing we see God doing in the story, God remembers while people forget. Let's say that together. God remembers, people forget. Let's do it again. God remembers, but people forget. Genesis 40, verses 13 through 15. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Only remember me, Joseph says, when it is well with you. And please do not, please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh. And so to get me out of this house, for I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews. And here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. Three days later, the dream was realized. Pharaoh's birthday, all of these dreams come true. But look at verse 23. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. In the first few words of the next chapter, after two whole years. Oh, so much for helping people, right? He helps him, he serves him. He says, hey, just do me the kindness of remembering me and uh, mention me to Pharaoh if you can. You know, I'm the one who interpreted your dream. Remember that, Remember, don't, don't forget and look where it gets him. Two years later, he's still in prison. See, Joseph is amazing. And, and we uh, look to him in, in some ways as a hero of this story, but really God's the hero of every story of the Bible. Does that make sense? Joseph, isn't, Joseph has his own problems, his own things, and we see one of those here. See, Joseph is amazing, but maybe he's getting a little tired. He's getting a little tired. He's getting a little worn out, tired of the preparation, tired of the school, tired of the pit, tired of the pasture, tired of Potiphar's house, tired of prison, all the peas in between. He's tired of it all. He's tired and weary of the preparation. He's becoming impatient. He's, he's opportunistic. And the word he uses to remember is the word zakar. Now there's a couple different words of, to remember in scripture. Uh, there's multiple words you could use, and writers do use multiple words. One is a very simple form of remember that is, um, you know, I recall I should have fed the dog. You know, I recall, I, oh, I, yeah, I met you last, I remember, I, I met you last week. You know, there's that kind of a stuff. And then there, there's a remember that is more connected to covenant. It, it's the, the word, and this is the word that is used here, zakar. It's... Um, it's used when, when God is, uh, it speaks of God and Noah after the flood. In Genesis chapter eight, it says God zakar, or God remembers Noah. He remembers him. Did God forget? Does God forget? Look at your neighbor and say, God doesn't forget. No, he doesn't forget. He didn't forget anything. Does that mean he recalled it? No, no, no. When he says God remembered Noah, it means he remembered his promises in his word, the things he had told Noah. He was recalling his covenant. 
And the question that Joseph is asking this guy is, would you remember in a deeper way, like his hope for his dream is in a person? Eh. Here's the thing about God. He's not really cool with us putting our hope in people in that way. See, we don't look to people to accomplish what God promised. We look to God to accomplish what God promised. We look for God to remember, not people, because people forget. People are unreliable people. I love them and God loves them, but let me just tell you, who we put all of our chips in on is God and his ability to recall and remember the covenant promise he's made, the dreams that he shared. And in this moment, Joseph misses it. He asked for a person to remember. And maybe you found yourself wondering the same things about the dreams that God's given you. You begin to think, God, do you remember? Maybe I need to make this happen. Maybe I need to position myself. Maybe I need to put a good word in. Maybe I need to take this thing. Maybe I need to get so-and-so who's influential to put in a good word for me. Maybe, maybe I need to do this or do that to make this thing speed up and move along. Now, I don't know the story here. I, um, I don't know what would have happened had he not asked the cupbearer to remember him in that way. He could have been out that day. The next day, within three days, he's out and in Pharaoh's presence. But no, 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 two years, he's still waiting. And over that time, I believe we see it played out in the rest of scripture. He totally gets it and understands. It's God, God's gotta be the one who remembers. He's the one who recalls. He's the one who brings about his purposes, his dreams and remembers his covenant. See, our, our hope, church, is not in our own strength. It's not in our own ability or favors of others, but the God who fulfills his promises. He's the God who remembers his word, the God who remembers his covenant people. He doesn't forget you. And some of you need to hear that today. He doesn't forget you. He hasn't forgotten the promises that he's made. And you could ask, God, do you remember me? Please remember me. Call out to him. God, remember you. Let me tell you, he will not forget. While people forget, God never does. He hasn't forgotten the dreams he's given you. What he placed inside of you. So what do we do with this? Here's what we do in conclusion. We gotta embrace the preparation that he's doing inside of us. We must uh, serve other people's dreams and begin to get our eyes off of ourselves. We gotta begin to look, God, is there people around us that you've called me to serve so that you can do what you wanna do in them? Embracing the preparation, not getting impatient and not giving up because his dream for your life is closer than you think. I can't tell you of how many people following Jesus have weathered this storm and that storm and they've gotten through. They're so close to breaking through and seeing the vision of God play out in their lives and, and, and seeing that become a reality. Yet they believe it's so far away that they give up right before the finish line. I've seen it. I've seen godly marriages that they've suffered through lots and God's brought them through lots and they're at the end. They don't see it. They lose heart and they're looking to a person instead of God and they give up on the marriage. I've seen it happen in businesses where and God's given them a promise. They just hold on to that promise. Even if it looks different than the way they thought it would look, they're holding on to whatever God has. If they'll just hold on and trust him, not look to man, but look to him, man, they'll see it. But so many times I've seen people give up in that moment. Let me encourage you, church, don't give up on what God has put in your heart. If it's really from God, as we talked about in week one, not your own dream, God's dream, 
God's dream for your business, God's dream for your marriage, God's dream for your family. Hold on to that dream and never let go because God never forgets. He always remembers his faithfulness. He's got a purpose and a plan for you. Hold on until the dream becomes a reality. Amen? Father, thank you for holding on to us. Thank you that you remember you remember our dream. And Lord, while others forget, while others are unreliable, you are always reliable. Father, I thank you that you've called us not just to be looking around trying to fulfill our own dreams, but you've called us to love and serve the dreams of others around us. Don't let us be so caught up in ourselves that we miss out on what you wanna do in the people you have around us that work in our neighborhoods and our families. And Father, we surrender ourselves and our lives to you. The preparation you're doing, continue to do. Father, we know that those that are in hardship or difficulty or hard circumstances right now, Father, I thank you that you're present there. And I pray right now that you would reveal your steadfast love to them. They would know you're near. And Father, thank you for remembering. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said.